Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First, though, the government has confirmed that over 30 tower blocks across England have now failed an emergency fire safety test so far, following the Grenfell Tower disaster in which 79 people are thought to have died. According to the government, the cladding from 34 tower blocks has been tested and all of them have failed the combustibility test. The government plans to examine up to 600 blocks and claim they can test 100 a day. The areas affected so far include Manchester, Plymouth and Portsmouth, as well as the London boroughs of Barnet, Brent, Camden and Hounslow. All the relevant landlords and fire services have been notified. Camden has already evacuated residents from 650 flats, while other councils have introduced interim measures, such as 24-hour fire warden patrols, to mitigate the risk before the cladding is removed. Yeah, when you look at the national scale of this now, this goes beyond austerity, it goes beyond finger pointing at individual councils. This is a clear national systemic failure for the country. I'm surprised actually the response has been as muted now in the last week as it, as it has been. I mean, initially there was a huge response, but it's kind of striking how every single building that they seem to test seems to fail these regulations. So we have a situation here where people are slightly confused about whether it's the regulations are at fault, whether or not it's the, you know, the cladding that's specifically at fault. And actually, you know, I think what's most alarming to people is the, is the insecurity. So that some people are being told to evacuate their blocks. That's what happened in Camden last mm. night, and they weren't told until quite late at night. It's very difficult for people to take pets out into this temporary accommodation and other people are being told to stay in this accommodation that may or may not be flammable. That is a, a huge unfolding. And perhaps unfolding putting fire process. wardens in instead. Yeah, and I think evacuation. people feel that, I think there is a problem as well, that people feel that this is something about social housing, and not all of these are mm. social housing, some of them are mixed blocks, but about a kind of certain type of neglect for people that the government, oh, successive governments have shown. People will rightly wonder why it is that the building regulations allowed or the building regulations were flouted in a way that allowed so much inflammable material to clad our buildings. Yeah, and it, if you look in other countries, in America and in Germany, some of this stuff is banned. There are some people who say some of the panelling that's been put up in this country is also banned, but there's been a huge collective regulatory failure. And this is, just goes to show what a sort of disaster housing policy has been in this country for a generation, frankly. Neither party has been able to get a grip on it. Um, they look like there are serial failures of the Tory council down uh, with the Grenfell Tower. But Labour was in charge of putting a lot of this stuff uh, into housing associations where the controls don't seem to have been uh, very very good over a long period and frankly what we need to do is build more homes and every government announces that they're going to build hundreds using of the right material of, using to hopefully using the right material um, but none of these governments have been able to build enough homes and, and we have this crisis of stock where people are put into um, you know uh, house like battery hens frankly in places which you know most people wouldn't want to but take it, a second look at if the building is certainly a Grenfell Tower if it hadn't been clad if they'd kept the old concrete facade, which was ugly, but it wouldn't have gone up in fire. This has been a systemic failure of government with a small g, national and local, Labour and Conservative. Absolutely, and it's not, I'm hearing suggestions now, it's not just about residential accommodation. There may be hospitals that have this material. There may be schools that have this material. I think politically the challenge now for the government obviously there's a huge logistical and sort of humanitarian challenge but also the politics of it as you rightly say that this isn't just something that is linked directly to Tory austerity and the government now the initial shock has kind of worn off uh, I think the challenge for the government is to make it clear that this isn't just their direct responsibility and the result of the Tory cuts agenda and there are plenty of Labour councils who also there bear responsibility. Be, Given it's a national crisis and, and, and a national failure, the government needs to be seen to be getting a grip of it. Well, absolutely. And I think that uh, most MPs would say that they were slightly, their response in the last few days has been slightly more convincing than it was early on. But there is still huge potential for this to snowball, particularly if we have other buildings, not just residential accommodation affected. I do think there has been a change in the national mood, though, and you see it even in the Conservative Party. You know, this, we had just had an election where actually the word austerity was barely mentioned. Yes. Philip Hammond relaxed his targets about hitting the deficit. There is an assumption 
you know, local councils really bore the brunt of the cuts. And actually, I think there is an assumption that they can't, they won't take any more. And the, and the mood has changed. People are tired of that. Indeed. OK. Hello and welcome from us. We'll be picking up on the latest information about the tower blocks and the capital at risk and reflecting on what we've learned so far about the Grenfell Tower fire itself. Where the recovery operation is likely to last, a police say, until the end of the year. I'm joined by the Conservative MP for Wimbledon, Stephen Hammond, and by Rushnara Ali, uh, Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bow. Welcome to you uh, both. Morning. A word first about what's happening uh, in Camden. Tenants of four blocks have spent a second night away from their homes. That is, apart from 80 or so residents, we've been told have refused to budge. The work to remove the cladding here could take three to four weeks. The Labour Control Council made the decision to evacuate buildings on the Chalcotts estate on Friday. So far, no other London council has followed suit, but we know there are issues around cladding in Barnet, Hounslow, Islington, Brent. Um, we suspect it's reported a couple of blocks in Wandsworth, uh, which has, like Croydon, says it's going to retrofit its towers with sprinklers. This is what the Mayor of London said this morning. I, I was in close contact with council, uh, with, with Camden Council, on uh, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. I think they've done the right thing. Look, you've got to err on the side of caution. You can't play Russian roulette with people's safety. And they've received the advice from the experts that acted on the uh, advice. And I'm hoping, uh, because the council speedily asked for mutual aid from other councils across uh, London, because the government has said they're committed to helping councils who need their uh, help, they will see as soon as possible the remedial work, the repairs being done on the building to make it safe so families can go back to their homes. Uh, Mr Stephen, a, a clear need for reassurance here. I mean, when 34 tests have come back with 34 positives for combustible material, um, this is a worry, isn't it? Of course it's a worry, Tim, and it's a worry because you know, people's lives, we've seen a tragic loss at Grenfell, uh, and therefore it's got to be done properly. Now, the problem then is to make sure that it's done, we, we do the testing, it's looking like that, then taking the fire advice, and that's clearly what's taken, but also making sure... Uh, as the government is now doing, making sure that there is support for councils and local authorities who are going to have to bear the cost of it. And as I understand it from fire services, the cost is going to vary quite dramatically from building to building, uh, because in itself the, the material is not a problem, it's what it's layered with which is the problem, making sure you understand that. And then the size of the building is a key. I was in Tower Hamlets this week and they don't appear to have the cladding that's, that's of worry, but you can just tell from the officers doing their checks that uh, there's real nervousness among their high-rise tenants and what can you do to reassure? Yeah, there's huge anxiety after the Grenfell Tower fire. Uh, I was visiting residents in a number of blocks where tests are being done. One In one case uh, we are waiting for, for advice from the department on whether the cladding needs to be removed. So we do have one block. Um, we've got fire wardens uh, monitoring and supporting local residents in that block. Uh, so so it's, we're not out of the woods either. But there's a bigger issue, which is that I'm not confident that this is being done systematically. The cladding issue is being ex ex inspected, I think, systematically. But we had a fire in my constituency yesterday in a lower rise building without cladding. And I'm really concerned that the government needs to step up the inspections and support across uh, blocks that could have wider issues, which has come up. Well, and well, I've flagged up these issues well, well, through the Communities and Local Government Committee last year, over the last year. And so we really need to look at this much more we'll widely. We'll touch some of those issues uh, a little bit later. But uh, so much of uh, this a blur. It has been one very tumultuous period for the capital. Uh, but the attack outside a mosque at the beginning of the week again puts safety and policing generally to the fore and senior police officer after senior police officer has been talking about the need for more money. Tanja Rashid reports. The emergency services put to the test again this week after a terror attack in Finsbury Park only days after the fire at Grenfell Tower. Across London, many are saying they don't feel safe, not least in the Muslim community who were subjected to the attack on Monday night. Some more things need to be done. Islamophobia, unfortunately, is on a raise, and the hate crime, hate crime is also on a raise, and we have to do something to stop this madness. This Muslim woman had to be comforted by the community's secretary, Sajid Javid. I, I was devastated, I was scared. For the community in an area I grew up in, I, I, I didn't know what else to do. The government is stressing it will take Islamophobic violence seriously. 
There is no place for this hatred in our country today and we need to work together as one society, as one community, to drive it out this evil that is affecting so many families. But the Mayor of London believes it's as much a question of resources for the Metropolitan Police, which has had to make savings of £600 million since 2010. My message to the government is the plans you have to make the further cuts of £400 million, don't do it. My message to the government is the plans you have to change the police funding formula so London loses more money, don't do it. But the opposition at City Hall say the mayor could find that money himself. They do need to find another £400 million of efficiency saving. £300 million of that had been earmarked before Sadiq Khan had ever been, even become mayor. The mayor's in charge of a, a gross budget approaching £17 billion. The £100 million that he is missing, and that is the real figure, not, not the figure that he's pushing in the media, is 0.59% of that. Um, any politician worth their salt can move things around to close that gap if he chooses to do it. Whatever the case may be, the Commissioner Cressida Dick admitted to BBC London this week that her officers were feeling the pressure. We're not having any fewer calls for help from the public. So we're stretched uh, and uh, I'm talking with the mayor and I'm talking with uh, the government about the resources that we need, uh, I believe, in the future. She has acted to increase the number of officers armed with tasers to respond to situations like the attack in North London. Right, taser on your shoulder. But after three terror attacks in as many months, many are wondering what else needs to be done to protect the people of this city. Well, joining me now, uh, Mac Chishti, uh, formerly the highest ranking Muslim police officer at Met. You were a commander until like two weeks ago, um, right. now retired. Um, can I pick up on something? Uh, the leader in Islington said this week he didn't think there had been a spike in, in hate crime after what happened at London Bridge. I think the mayor of London said there had been. Mm -hmm. do, do, what do you understand is the picture? Have we seen an increase in hate crimes? Oh, oh, definitely. There's been a rise in Islamophobic hate crime following both Manchester, but more so following the London Bridge attack, to a point where it's reached unprecedented levels. It will stay like that and it will return back to normal, but there has been a definite increase. And if there has been an increase, what can be done about it? Well, a number of things. Firstly, what we want to do is we want to prevent communities from becoming divided and turning upon uh, one another. So it's important to address the problem, respond to the incident very quickly, have a community impact assessment so you understand the whole circumstances of it and make sure communities and victims feel confident. And this is about reaching out so they have confidence to report. So I'm very pleased that they are reporting because that's one of the main aims that we have. And how did you observe and feel the response was not just by uh, uh, the police, but it seemed by community leaders of all faiths and politicians to what happened at Islington. Uh, I thought, uh, despite the absolute horrendous attack, the fact that frontline officers got there and they neutralised the, the threat within eight minutes was excellent and complete tribute and testament to their professionalism. I thought the way the community reacted, especially the imam, just showed the human spirit about our own principles and our own values, and that was a really good example. And I thought the way politicians, police and the community and other partners came together showed that ability of standing together, which is important, against any threat, condemning it and being strong and defiant. Um, so you can talk freely now, of course. Now you're out of the force. I mean, do you think the police have been doing enough to recognise and tackle, deal with Islamophobia? I think that, I mean, I, I was responsible for hate crime uh, uh, during my tenure in the Met and a lot of effort goes in there. A lot of the effort you don't see because it's based within communities, outreach programmes, using lots of other networks. You mean what, poli police, you mean, or, or, no, no, or local the, the, governments? The, the, no, 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 well, uh, community networks themselves. And yeah. the, the idea here is there's one thing about responding to it in a very professional, highly skilled way, and we're building our ability to do that. But most importantly is to reach people, to give them confidence to say, despite how low you may think it is, how small you may think it is, it's important you tell us so we can identify hotspots, identify trends, be in places where it may be occurring, to make sure we deter it and prevent it. And if we can't, we catch somebody and take them to justice. All right, so uh, where are the blockages? Where do you think things should be improved? I think there's a lot of times that people uh, are just accepting that it's a way of life. It's not, and they shouldn't have to. It doesn't matter if it's a glance, if it's an incident, or whether or not it's somebody who just uh, you know, tugs at your, your, your headscarf. Uh, you may think that the police can't do much about this, but we want to know, because at least we can put ourselves at, on that bus for the next journey to make sure that everyone else is reassured. For your sake, community's sake, let us know. Rashanara, what are people telling you? Is enough being done to, to tackle this? 
Well, there is huge anxiety. Uh, in my constituency, we have had numerous attempts by far-right groups um, who've been demonstrated out, so who've demonstrated outside the East London Mosque, and we've had a lot of support from the police. We've also had in the past Anjum Chowdhury and the Muslim Defence League, um, and the community actually wants quick, instant um, response from the police. We have had that, but one of the issues is the balance between protest and incitement to violence and I think the government needs to look at both kinds of protests and make sure that uh, that is dealt with uh, firmly because we just can't have violence taking place outside um, religious buildings and, and others. The second point is that the support that the Home Office offered for security in mosques, um, I'm glad that the government's reviewing the process because mosques like the Islam Mosque didn't get the grants that they applied for even though they've been victims of hate crime. So they do need to address that. And the final point is around police and community support officers. The former Met Commissioner uh, cons uh, raised alarm bells about the cut from 5,000 to 1,800. They are the eyes and ears of our communities and now in my constituency the police are having to work with local communities to have community wardens and train them. Now that's one thing okay. but we can't have that as a substitute for policing which is where some areas are having to head because of the 20,000 police cuts. Stephen how's your community responded to London Bridge and then what they've seen here? Well I think a lot of people um, have quite rightly stood up and, and said uh, really, partly exactly what Max said, which is that we can't allow terrorism to become routine. Mm. You know, we must say this is abnormal. We must stand up against it. And I think the Prime Minister was absolutely right in, in reviling it, and we as a, a country must do that. That's very much the reaction. So I work very closely with one of the mosques in my constituency. There was a, an extra peace walk after Manchester uh, just to, to highlight what they're doing within the community. Uh, but I think there are a number of things that are coming through. And the first thing, of course, is the Home Secretary's response to establish a counter-extremist uh, commission, which will tackle some of the points that Russia Nara was talking about, which is key. I think also that some of the programmes that have not been so highlighted, that have worked really well, the Channel programme that's worked, for instance, with a 1,000 people to stop them being radicalised, is one of those great successes that no-one hears too much mm -hmm. about. Very quick, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mac about that in a second, but a very quick point about, do you think uh, the £400 million cuts that are threatened for the Met over the next three years will now happen? Can they happen? It's, it's not politically, you know, endurable, is it? Well, there's a d dispute about the size, as you've heard from your piece, the Gareth Bacon quite rightly pointing out that the, the mayor could choose to make things. I think what the government has said is that they're going to look at, on top of protecting the police budget in real terms over the next five years, they're putting an extra 500 million for counter-terrorism issues. And clearly, as a London MP, I'm going to be arguing that London needs the bulk. Let me just ask you a final word. Channel working, do you agree with that? And also, where, do you, where are you on the funding? Well, I, I think Channel is working. You've got to remember, it's not just about Islamic extremism. That I think 25% is about far-right extremism as well, so it's across the board. In terms of cuts, so w w when the cuts started, uh, the saving programme, uh, we were very much focused on traditional types of crimes, the things that we were very familiar with. Going forward, there's been a lot of change. We've seen cyber, we've seen online abuse, we've mm. seen hatred, we've seen uh, more awareness around vulnerability, the care for victims, domestic abuse, as well as sexual crime. So I think the mission has grown mm. at the same time of where we've been um, constricting our resource base. And going forward, I think the sensible question to be is, actually, can that continue? I don't think it can. I think there needs to be a rethink okay. around mm. that. But certainly, I would just like to pay once again tribute to our frontline yeah. officers, okay. whose public service ethos is mm. immeasurable. But there's going to be, always be a limit to the stamina. Max Christie, thanks so very much indeed Thank for you. being here today. Uh, recovery, resilience, rehousing, and of course recrimination. What happened at Grenfell Tower is testing public agencies and political leaders, national as well as local, to the limit. Dan Friedman assessed things there this week. <laughs> Red Watch, returning to Grenfell for the first time since the fire, to get closure and to apologise to those they couldn't save. But their welcome is mixed. Do not come here and attack my crew. If we were not here, yeah? yeah. Yo, 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 yo. It feels like the mood here is changing. It's been just over a week since fire tore through the Grenfell Tower, killing an as yet unknown number of people. But as the shock subsides and the anger rises, a day of rage march is planned for central London. Justice! Justice for Grenfell! Justice for Grenfell! The 
protest passes peacefully, but the anger is still raw. When will it happen again? Where will it happen again? Will I be there? Who will be there? Who will I lose? These are the questions for everyone in every tower block. What does justice look like? Justice looks like going around, checking every single building that has got any fire hazard in it, going around, checking every single one of them, anywhere where they've got that material where it should not be. Change it, change it now. This week, local authorities said hundreds of English tower blocks may have used similar cladding to that used at Grenfell. The government says no one will be left to live in unsafe buildings and promised an urgent public inquiry. But for Louise Christian, the tragedy represents the unlearned lesson. She spent four years seeking justice after the last major UK tower block fire at Lackanal House in Camberwell. She acted for the six victims' families at the inquest. At the time it happened, there was huge shock. And a public inquiry was announced and then the public inquiry got delayed and delayed because of the criminal investigation which went on for four and a half years. The public inquiry was downgraded into being an inquest. The media lost interest, but more importantly, the government that's now in power didn't adopt any of the recommendations. So, for example, sprinklers weren't retrofitted in tower blocks. Uh, there wasn't a review of the building regulations. Uh, and, uh, you know, nothing happened. But the fire brigade unions say the government must now grasp the nettle. Do you think this could be a Hillsborough moment? I think it's got to be a major, major turning point, like Hillsborough, like other tragedies, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it seems that in this country we only seem to learn when something this horrific happens. Osama lives in a neighbouring tower block and asked us not to film his face. I was speaking to my neighbour and she said, you know, her kids have to look at that every day when they wake up. Every day, you know, when you go to the kitchen or when you go to the balcony, you have to see that it's... It's literally a graveyard outside your house. He says there's a lot to do to make his block safe. Sometimes both lifts are broken down so that, for example, I would have to walk more than 10 floors a day, up and down, up and down. I can imagine how that would be for elderly people living on the 16th floor or whatever. And then you see the poor maintenance of these buildings. It's like they have no regard for the residents who live here. Lives lost lives devastated and too early to know whether this time the response will be different well i'm joined here by mike granite who set up uh, the civil contingency secretariat which is the department uh, in the cabinet office uh, responsible for emergency planning now retired some time ago but um what did you think about the response here uh, not the emergency response, but to the displaced people, the survivors and something mounted by Kensington and Chelsea. Well, I think it very stalled very clearly at the beginning when it shouldn't have done. It shouldn't have done because there are good arrangements in place in London. They're so good. They're cited in guidance to local authorities from the government and from the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, which was issued in 2014. And we should have seen mutual aid from the 32 boroughs and the city rolling in. We should have seen a response from the very beginning where Plans that should have been practised and tested went into place very quickly to handle some of these things. And we should have seen Kensington and Chelsea call in help very quickly when they couldn't cope. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't this happen? I don't know, but sometimes senior managers actually simply freeze in the face of these things. It can be very difficult for a senior manager to say we're not coping. The training, though, the exercising and the arrangements that are cited should have made it very easy to do that. You say they're good procedures. Am I right in thinking that they could only be triggered with the say-so of Kensington and Chelsea Council? And if they kept on saying, no, we'll cope with this on our own, um, then you couldn't trigger them? That might have been what happened. It might does look been, very much like that happened. It does. It, uh, Other authorities from London only came and got involved yep. more than 48 hours afterwards. Indeed so. Well, well, what would you say about that? Well, I think they must have been pushed into it, and pushed into it not simply by other local authorities, but by the government. Uh, and they clearly weren't enough resources in London to get the job done, even with London's resources, because by Monday they were calling in the emergency planners from Kent and Surrey. But then surely there must be a flaw in the system. You'd not like to see a change in the system that it can be triggered independently, immediately. Why wasn't this become, why did this not become a pan-London response within a few hours on Wednesday It's difficult morning? to know because the chief executive at Kensington and Chelsea would have been sitting on the gold group run by the police to actually manage the incident. He should have known 
and his council should have known and his political leadership should have known at, very early on that they were facing a, a catastrophe of this. Well then surely sh there should be now a system where it gets triggered by someone out outside of that council. So. You'd hope so but at the end of the day actually the people best to do these things are people with the resources on the ground who know the place. Um, I think there will have to be a better system in place, one where central government might have to intervene early on and other boroughs are allowed to intervene early on to ask very serious questions say, do you want our help? We're sending it now. You see, with these, these, these events, you should throw the resources at it early and get ahead of it. By the time you have failed to do that, it is too late. So should, should the government have acted much more qu uh, quickly here to say, this is London-wide, you can't go. No, whatever you say, KNC, we are coming in. I think the public inquiry that's been called about this should, after it's dealt with the emergent, with the urgent matters of fire protection, should look very hard at this system. It's going to be um, very awkward, very uncomfortable for you, your government, isn't it, and your local authority, KNC, when this all comes out in the wash in the uh, inquiry? Well, there's going to be a public inquiry, as Mike has said. Well, yeah. It's important to see what the what that comes out of that and the Prime Minister was right in the House of Commons to stand up and apologize and say the initial response was not good enough the response now of course has kicked in and it, undoubtedly it should be faster but you know everybody will have temporary accommodation within three weeks permanent housing is being found for people the Bellwind system has kicked in there's a Grenfell Tower uh, recovery fund which is already going HMN, HMT the Treasury is making sure that people can access their bank accounts DWP is now making sure that people can access their benefits look the response at the beginning was poor the Prime Minister stood up but quite rightly one of the things we'll have to look at is maybe it should be the government triggers this in future but the government has now um, later in the day but absolutely now on top of this and absolutely funneling uh, the help to the people that need it. And one of the things I think will also come out of this inquiry is to make sure we look at fire regulations in the future. Now, as a result of that uh, previous, the Latinal fire, DCLG did say things to local. The lady was wrong. DCLG did give Pass instructions. Pass them over to them. Can I just bring it around? what do you say about the response? Could it happen to any authority? Well, I, I, I agree with the points that have been made about the response needing to be early. And it's really worrying that the government didn't step in quickly enough. In, in the event of terror, terrorist attacks, we've got a much better system of rapid response. And we need to draw on those lessons to make sure that we learn lessons quickly in the event of, God forbid, any future fires. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that... The, the, just briefly, on the um, response after the previous in, uh, inquiries, the DCLG committee raises issues in 2012, 2013. Other, uh, l over the last year, I've raised a number of issues about building regulations and safety, and it's fallen on deaf ears, I'm afraid, and we just cannot have that in the future. Uh, Stephen Hammond, uh, an unelected representative, the civil servant takes the rap and resigns, the chief executive there. No political accountability here? Uh, there's clearly political accountability. The Prime Minister in the House of Commons has stood up and said, we, fail, we failed and we should have done faster. The response subsequent to that, I think, has been good and, and in, is how it should have been. But of course there's been political acceptance and we got it wrong at the start. Uh, and that will be one of the lessons to learn from that. But the key thing, actually, is that this is um, affecting those people. We need to be making sure we're doing the things now that help them. Mike Granite, um, really uh, good to have you here. Thanks for your uh, insight. Rashanara, Stephen, uh, really grateful. We'll be returning, as you know, to what happens here in the aftermath and to what happens in the tower blocks uh, for several weeks and months to come.